We would like to thank Soft Ride for bringing you this episode of The Ride. Welcome back to another episode of The Ride. This is Nicole. And this is Michaela. And this week we have a really cool interview with uh, Gillian Larson, who, if you are on social media, especially on Instagram, she has an account called The Through Rider, and she documents all of her travels and experiences and the good and the bad and the, the ugly side, the you know beautiful side of of traveling across the country. She's done some pretty amazing trails. Um, I think she might be one of the first horse riders to accomplish some of these trails. So it was really cool to learn more about her and her story and how she even got started on this journey because she just kind of jumped in. She just jumped in and, and went for it. Like she, you know, didn't have a ton of experience and just kind of set her mind to it and learned as she went and, and thankfully had a few people to offer her guidance, you know, she would run into on the trails and stuff, but you know, she kind of learned as she went, which is very intimidating. And I mean, good for her for doing something that, you know, that crazy. And yeah, it's super inspiring that she just really dove in head first. She was like, I love horses. I love trail riding. She saw some information on some trails and she was like, I'm gonna go and do it. And she was really young too. So that's another thing that it's like, she was a young person and decided to just tackle this. So, like I said, super inspiring. And she's ridden over 10,000 miles of trails. And just to think about that, that's that's a lot of miles to put on, you know, some horses and yourself, especially just riding completely through. Yeah. So I totally enjoyed this interview. And we touch on her new short film that came out and I think you can watch it on YouTube. Michaela is going to post a link to it um, in the show notes because uh, it, it does give you a little more info about her. And also, I mean, this is beautiful where she's trail riding and, and what she's experiencing and seeing. So be sure to check that out too, if you want to learn more about her. Yeah. But let's dive into some current events. One of my favorite things that I want to talk about is the stallion stakes, the, National Rain Cow Horse Association Stallion Stakes and Aaron Torimino took home a win. And I just, I don't know. I love Aaron. I fangirl over Aaron. I think that she's just one of the coolest riders out there. Yeah. So she won the Stallion Stakes, um, which, you know, it's always such a big deal when a female in the cow horse does win an event like that. And we're seeing it more often now, which is really exciting. Uh, you know, with Sarah Dawson winning the Snapple bit last year, becoming the second woman in history to win that event. Um, and then Aaron, you know, is starting out the year pretty hot, going into the Stallion Stakes and winning it. And she won a few other events there, too. So she had a fantastic week. But, yeah, she's such a talented rider. We've done some stuff with her in the magazine. Um, we just had a new blog post come out with Aaron uh, about – doing something new and, and, you know, kind of expanding your disciplines and riding to like kind of learn something new about yourself and your horse and just everything in between. Uh, so if you haven't checked that out yet, you totally should because she offers some great advice, but I talked, I reached out to Erin last week and she's super interested in being on the podcast. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll, we'll be able to get her on here and record with her and learn more about her. But she was in the um, the Down the Fence documentary, which came out a couple years ago. Uh, so anybody who's probably seen that, she was the female that was, you know, they, they followed her journey that year. And um, so, yeah, I'm super excited to see her win because I think she's such a talented rider. And I think what I really connect with her about is that she came from the all around too. And then she got into the cow horse as an adult. And that's kind of been my journey as well. So I love knowing that there's somebody else out there with that kind of journey. And it ended up helping her be really successful in the cow horse pen because of her knowledge she learned elsewhere. 
Yeah, I was going to say, I think that having the all around background, I know we've mentioned this so many times, it's just a great foundation and a lot of really great riders come from that background and it really shows when they transition to a new event and I think that Aaron is a prime example of that one. Some other things to go over, we are releasing more on-demand videos. I think our Winston Hansma videos are coming out. I think they just launched this week starting today. Um, and that is going to be our new cutting horse series because we haven't really done any cutting stuff. Uh, so we thought we would expand our video library to add some of that. So if you haven't had a chance to check out Horse and Rider On Demand, we have that seven day free trial going on. Uh, and be sure to let us know what content you're really looking forward to seeing. Yeah, I know that we've received a lot of response that everybody loves our ranch riding videos, especially our ranch riding videos with Bud. Um, who doesn't love Bud? And then we also have some new ranch versatility videos that are coming up in the lineup. We've received a lot of requests for those. So we've heard you. So if you guys have anything that you want to watch on Horse and Rider On Demand, be sure to let us know because we, we are listening and we want to do the videos that you want to watch. Some more things that I want to talk about is the fact that we obviously love podcasts around here. Um, this podcast is our pride and joy, and Nicole and I love getting to talk to each other and talk to some of the greatest horse people in the industry and people with some inspiring stories. But the Equine Network has quite a few podcasts that are horse-related, and I know that I see on Facebook all the time people are looking for horse-related podcasts to listen to, and we are the home to several podcasts that can reach a variety of interests, everything from veterinary stories to English to Western to general horse ownership to careers in the equine industry. We have so many different podcasts. Uh, just to name a few, we have the Ask Annie podcast, Barn Stories by Equus Magazine, Beyond the Saddle, Disease Du Jour by Equine Management, Dressage Today, Practical Horsemen, and The Score. So we have quite a few. There are so many more. So if you're interested, Go to our website. You'll be able to find all of the podcasts that we have within the Equine Network because, like I said, we just really, really love podcasts around here. And on that note, let's jump into this interview. Every good horseman knows that the health of a horse's feet and legs is vital. Standing tied in a stall or especially in a moving trailer can lead to fatigue and soreness, draining energy that would have been better spent with you in the saddle. By providing traction, support, stability, shock absorption, and comfort, Soft Ride Gel Comfort Boots decrease fatigue and help your horse recover faster so you can get back on the trail or to competition. Soft Ride Boots include exclusive deep gel patent orthotics and are the only comfort boot that can be used with or without shoes. The gel insert improves circulation in the hoof and provides relief of static tension to the deep flexor tendon. For more information on all of the products Soft Ride creates to help your horse, check out the Soft Ride website, www.softrideboots.com. Hey, so today we are here with Gillian Larson, who is, we actually, Michaela and I found out about her several years ago uh, because she was kind of the talk of our office, actually, and I didn't even tell her this, um, but we were all obsessing over her Instagram and her, you know, journey and her stories and everything about it. And so we've been following Gillian's story for a while now, but we're finally getting to talk with you in person. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to have you on the podcast. Yes. Thank you guys so much for having me. So your Instagram is called the through rider and, um, it, it, you have a huge following on there, but can you kind of explain how you got started in this journey? It sounds like, um, you know, you kind of just, went out there and said, I'm going to do it. And you did it. 
that was that was sort of it. It's it's never like the greatest plan that I had. Uh, <laughs> it was one of those things of you know I was graduating from my undergraduate degree and I was out. It was like the summer before. Um, you know, it was August time, and I was going to graduate in December. And I kind of was looking for something that would spark my interest because I wanted to do something fun before starting grad school again the following August. So I knew I kind of had a year to, you know, do something interesting. You know, I had like a couple months to figure it out before I was going to be free to do said something. Um, and so I was kind of looking around and I had studied abroad um, like a year or so before and I had enjoyed it, but I kind of knew the abroad thing wasn't going to be how I wanted to spend this like window of time because when I was abroad for school, I really missed my horses. And so I was kind of like, ah, you know, already a little uncertain about what I was going to do that, you know, I was really going to enjoy. And so I was kind of like, I don't really want to go abroad. And so I'm out hiking with my mom in this August of my uh, summer. And she brings up that she read this article in the LA Times about a woman who hiked the Pacific Crest Trail and she set like the, the speed record for hiking it. And that's why there was an LA Times article on it. And so she's telling me, you know, about this amazing woman and her hike. And the part that was for me the most mind blowing was the woman hiking it and realizing how many miles she did, but also just the fact that this trail existed. And, you know, no one had ever mentioned it to me before and it just never come up. And so learning about the trail was kind of that spark. And then just realizing that, you know, it felt kind of like the timing was going to be right with ha having this, uh, you know, unusual break. Because it's not often in your life that you just have five months where you can just be like, yeah, I have the free time to go do this. And so it was that really nice alignment of, you know, finding something that sparked my interest and realizing that I had this like window of opportunity to try to knock it out. It would have been nice if the window of opportunity wasn't so close on the horizon because there wasn't a whole lot of time to prep for it. And I had a horse who at the time um, was recovering from an injury and there was this, it was very stressful the whole time getting ready for the ride because I wasn't even sure if I was going to have a horse to ride. <laughs> and so it was all, all incredibly uh, terribly prepared for and not really ready to go. But again, not often do windows of opportunity appear. So we kind of just, despite the lack of preparation and really knowing what I was doing, we just kind of, you know, showed up at the Mexican border and we're like, okay, well, we'll give it the old try. Well, I want to kind of touch more on your preparation, but first I want to backtrack a little bit and ask how you got involved in horses and what your horse life looked like prior to starting this. I grew up in LA, so it's not the most horsey place. Um, but we do have a bit of like a horse show industry and my mom was involved in that. She was a dressage rider. And so she competed in dressage and she did jumping too when she was younger. But um, I got into the horse thing because of my mom always having me around the barn and horses, you know, from being a very young kid. Um, and, you know, one of her favorite ways to kind of like entertain me once I became old enough to not necessarily kill myself unsupervised was to like plop me on a pony while she'd be having her little lesson and just, you know, let me go, you know, wander around the boarding facilities on my little Shetland pony while she would be doing that. And I think from a very young age, I was probably given like too much, you know, freedom with a pony and probably associated horses with that. And, you know, in my neighborhood growing up, I had a horse, um, you know, that I got when I was seven. And then we moved at one point and I was 11 or 12 and we brought him to our backyard and, you know, we didn't have anyone else in our backyard. So again, now I was out really riding by myself in the state park and, you know, going out for a couple hours with just my horse and I'm like 12 years old and I got really comfortable just being with a horse and going out and exploring new trails and, you know, went to college and then in college everyone was kind of into showing again and now I'm still that you know that one trail rider who likes to go out so again riding alone a lot in college and you know exploring with my horses and putting them in the trailer and trying to go now trailer to maybe some places to explore so it was kind of this like forced exploration simply because I didn't really have someone to go with me because LA was not the place of uh, that kind of just interest in horseback riding, let alone trail riding. 
So it was, you know, both my own from a young age and also, I guess, circumstantial, but that was just the environment that I was raised in where it's like, well, you can either go and do it by yourself or you could not do it at all was sort of how it felt growing up a little bit. You know, it's so funny that you say this about LA because Michaela and I've had multiple horse trainers on this podcast that are from the LA area, Southern California, and they all say the same thing, but somehow we just keep ending up with all these LA natives on our podcast. So there are some of you horse people around there. There's definitely a good sized horse community. It's just not necessarily the most adventurous community in terms of like trail riding. And there are quite a few just because there's so many people in LA. I mean, there's 11 million. So even if proportionally, there's not a lot of us, we, there's still a lot of us. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's just, I haven't found too many horseback riders and at least my friend group growing up, I had like one friend who rode horses. Um, and that was about, about it. And she lived on the other side of, you know, the Canyon from me. So I couldn't get to her easily. And it was just kind of like, again, you know, okay, well, it'll just be me. Um, and in college, you know, there's not a whole lot of girls that bring their horses and the ones who did, you know, were usually incentivized because they were in rodeo or showing not a lot. We're going to go through the hassle, you know, of bringing a horse just to trail ride. Cause that's usually kind of the stereotype. It's like, Oh, it's just trail riding. So like how much effort do I really want to put into it just to trail ride? And I was, you know, the person who wanted to put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> It's so funny that you say just trail ride because we get into this a lot, even with like a couple of weeks ago, we talked with this guy who does mental athletics and we talked about, you know, like it's super important in the show pen to have this uh, mental, you know, toughness, but you also have to have that for trail riding. It's not just trail riding. There's so much that you have to be prepared for and mentally, physically, both you and your horse. So yeah, I, I, I hate the stereotype just trail riding because I do think that it takes a lot of skill and ability to do it safely. And not to mention, I mean, the rides that you have shared on your social media is they're insane. I mean, you would have to have a ton of skill to be, you know, and, and bravery to do some of that stuff. Yeah, and it's definitely just how far and how aggressively you want to do it. I had a very athletic mare that didn't really have a good brain for showing, you know, like the obvious thing that a lot of people always ask is, oh, why didn't you go into endurance riding? And my mare was so uber competitive that, it, you know, I felt like she had all the athleticism to be like a 1D barrel horse or to be, you know, a Tevis champion. And she could have done competition physically, but she, it was like, you put her with another horse that she didn't know. And it was just like, you know, all the fun just kind of like got sucked out of the situation for me because she would just be on such this wild level. And it felt more like trying to control her rather than getting to just be a partnership where when it was just me and her, we were a partnership. And I think that's also to kind of like what facilitated it. And then, but because she was truly an athlete, you know, it became more than just trail riding for us because, you know, it was always about trying to, you know, keep her, you know, mentally stimulated and, you know, athletic. And so we would, you know, easily go knock out 15 miles between classes. You know, I would have to like plan my schedule around my horse and when I'm when getting classes to know that, okay, you know, a couple times a week, I got to get her out for, you know, several hours in between classes because she can't wait till the weekend to get out and it was definitely a big commitment and it was mostly just driven by her being this you know not totally mentally stable horse when around other horses but very physically driven and so that that really pushed us to being very trail oriented so is she the only horse that you took out with you or did you take another horse with you when you went I technically had three. I had um, my like, geriatric horse that I'd had since I was seven when I started college. I had my main riding horse, my mare, Shyla, and then her colt was um, about three years old when I started college. And so I took, to, I had like three to start. I believe I left one behind at home, the youngster with my mom, just because, you know, she could board him at a facility and get some miles on him. And I took the, the oldie and my main riding horse and my older horse, um, you know, he was like in his thirties at this point. So he was very old <laughs> and he needed daily medication. So that was kind of like the idea of him coming to college, but it ended up being a bit too much for him because it was very hilly. 
and he had a heart condition so he couldn't like he needed a lot of like flat land to get exercise he couldn't go walking up hills anymore and so i ended up you know part way through my first year sending him home and then by the time i was going to go in like the summer in between first and second year he passed so then i had two for like the rest of college um and then i could bring my my young horse who was then four at the time dakota then i brought him up to college so then I, be, I usually had two and depending on how much class i had i basically kind of rotated them out um and my mom would take care of one at home and that horse would basically get time off and then i'd have one in work with me at college and like every three months or so i basically would rotate them out it gets challenging when you have horses in college. We've we've both did that same thing where we had, I, you know, Michaela does the barrel racing and I came from the performance horse world. And yeah, it, it's it was always a challenge to fit in the, you know, school and, you know, the the riding and keeping your horses fit and, you know, throwing in the barrel racing and the horse showing and going on trail rides. And it, it's tough to manage that when you're so young. So props to you for managing multiple. <laughs> Well, at least I'm only really doing one at a time. I was mostly, you know, like rotating and, you know, thankfully my mom didn't mind taking care of him at home. So yes, and it was, there was a couple times where I got to have them both. Like I said, my mare got injured one year at the end there. So I had them both up at that time because I had my mare at a rehab facility and then I had my gelding, you know, on campus. And so that was, there was a couple times when I had both, but definitely if I felt, you know, make sure that I wasn't slacking too much behind in school and stuff so as you're preparing to head out back then how did you prepare your horse for this kind of trip oh ah uh, so yeah not too much preparation um because my horse basically didn't become sound you know i started trying to bring her back into work starting in uh i guess probably january and we were going to leave April and, you know, rehab never seems to go in a straight line. You know, it's always like one step, two steps forward, one step back. So we had a lot of that for a couple months and she didn't really become consistently sound until March. And I remember being worried, you know, like, okay, wow, we have like, you know, three-ish weeks before I'm leaving. Um, but she became sound and I was lucky enough that my mom was going to, we timed it with her spring break because I didn't know what I was doing. And so I wanted to have, you know, some like backup there to, until I got, you know, <laughs> got some some skills under me for a couple of weeks. And so my mom spent her spring break coming down with me. So it allowed me to kind of rotate both horses. And so you know, the first day I rode my younger horse um, 20 miles and I met my mom at like a road crossing and switched out for my horse who I was still uncertain about, you know, like, is her leg really healed? You know, will she break down? And then I only rode her six miles that day. And the next day I rode one horse, like 20 miles and another one, you know, 10 miles or something like that. And so I kind of switched them out while I had my mom with me, just kind of seeing how they felt. And they were both heavily worked in you know, college. And I felt like I was doing a lot of high intensity rides, especially with my, you know, young, healthy horse. And my mare was just naturally gifted. So even with all that time off, um, she, she was being hand walked a lot at the, at the rehab facility. And she had, you know, treadmill work and all that jazz. So she was, had no problem swinging into it. I've never, I never had problems with those two bringing them into fitness. And I have found that a lot of like canter and hill work in terms of high intensity translates really well to low intensity but longer distances um i found that i don't have to prepare too crazy at home as long as the horses are doing a lot of like you know cantering and trotting up hills if they can do that here at home then they are fit enough to go out on trails for a walking pace even if it's like 20 30 miles yeah, it's. I mean, it's definitely important to have a horse that's conditioned for for the kind of stuff that you were doing. I mean, you're not just, you know, moseying down a trail. You're climbing, you know, mountains and there's altitude and hills and rocky terrain. And I think I've even seen videos of on your Instagram of you going over fallen trees and logs and and water crossings. And so, definitely important to have a physically fit horse to do something like that. Yeah, and a lot of the skills that they end up learning, you know at least especially in the beginning until you get out there, you really don't end up preparing for it. And it's much more of a learn by once you get out there kind of experience, you know, now at home, now that I've been out there so many times, like now 
my training regimen is much more tailored to it. You know, like I like to teach my horses how to jump and I like to have them just have that confidence when it comes to jumping. And, you know, some horses that I've acquired recently were not, you know, I didn't own them for 10 years before I went out and did it like I did the first time. So just kind of by being together for so long, the horses had certain skills. But now that, you know, I'm trying not to, you know, wait a decade for some of my new horses to be ready. Now we do have like more of a strategy involved in terms of training them. And I had one mare that had, you know, not really done anything for 10 years of her life. And she was so clumsy, you know, it would trip over everything. And so part of getting her ready for the trip and getting her ready to, you know, be a good distance horse, you know, I had to walk all the downhills because she would stumble a lot. And so to like help her, you know, she didn't have like the strength to like go downhills coordinated or, you know, really the thought process. And so I would just get off a lot and just walk all the downhills on these really rocky terrains and kind of let her figure it out. And, you know, she definitely improved. So now there's you know different, different problems and a much more accelerated timeline with new horses. But in the beginning there, it was all just, you know, by being together for so long that we happened to, to pull it off. I'd had my mare for like nine years when we got on the trail and I'd had my gelding since he was born so, and I'd had him for about seven years. So we had a lot of history and that was about the only thing that I had going for myself was we had great communication. I had great communication with my horses and no other skills. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> Uh, the way you talk about them, it sounds like you had a really great bond with them and, and continue to have a good bond with, uh, the ones that you have now currently. Uh, but so there's a lot that goes into the horse part of doing something crazy like this, but there's also just a lot of other stuff that you have to like, and it sounds like you learned as you went, but when it comes to like camping and shelter and water and food and all that. Were you, were you into camping before you started this? How, you know, how did that work? Did you have to just kind of like learn as you went? Um, I had never uh, like camped or I'd camped in like the front country. I'd never like truly camped in the back country. Um, so that was the total new aspect. My mom had taken me horse camping, like, you know, at like a horse campground, you know, growing up. So I was like familiar with that aspect of it. Um, but I'd never done any, really any backcountry stuff. I'd never packed in my own, I'd never cooked my food in the backcountry, never done anything like that. So that was all new to me, um, let alone camped with my horses in the backcountry. And again, because we were running up so, so close to the end there, you know, I was worried I wasn't going to have two horses and I was even trying to find ways to maybe pull it off with one horse. And so my kind of gear was all over the place in terms of, you know, needing different stuff for one horse versus if I had two horses. And I remember, you know, setting up, you know, a high line, which is a rope between two trees in the backyard, you know, just to make sure I knew how to even tie the knot to do it or how, how to set it up. You know, and I remember doing that one day and looking at it and I can't, I don't even think I put a horse on it. I had a lot of trust in my horses or, you know, just blissful ignorance um, and just kind of looked at it and was like, yeah, 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 okay, that'll be, that'll be fine. And, you know, I remember I couldn't even be bothered because I was too busy kind of getting my mare in shape and I was trying to figure out the packing thing. The packing thing was throwing me for a loop. And so my main focus was learning how to pack my horse. And I remember my mom being like, she's, you've never like set up your tent that we bought, you know, maybe you should do that. And I was like, I, I'm sure it's okay. And my mom being like the worried one, she like set it up in the backyard and like, you know, forced me to like walk outside and like look at it. She's like, here's what it looks like. So you, you need to know what it looks like when you get out there. I'm like, okay, got it. Mental picture taken. So there was definitely some corners being cut in certain places, but for stuff that I was worried about, like, will my you know pack horse be ready I was trying to prepare him my mom my main focus was I can probably figure it out for myself but I did want the horses to be moderately prepared and so I you know had to train the pack horse how to pack because it's a bit of an odd sensation for them to basically triple and width um, when you put the boxes on the side of them and you know me being new I didn't know that you know I got the bear proof stuff because you need bear proof boxes for the Sierras but those are kind of like a bit of an aggressive like step up from nothing like normally you should start with like a duffel bag packed with hay or something soft so that when they're like you know playing bumper cars with trees you know they don't totally freak themselves out I didn't know that and so we definitely had you know a, a couple of rough experiences in the beginning of my pack horse you know being certain he was going to die um 
until I, you know, saw how well that went and then like, you know, found um, some like packers that I like called and I was like, I don't think I'm doing it right. And they had a couple tips for me, but I was kind of just doing it through YouTube and telephone calls with, you know, basically people who made packing gear and being like, I'm not doing this right. Like, what should I do? Um, and just doing it from home that way. And it wasn't a very pretty setup. I finally ran into like a real life packer once I was about a thousand miles in and they were able to like, you know, show me some better techniques. And I had one packer that even gave me like a lash cinch with a rope on it and taught me a different kind of hitch. And I, st I used that lash cinch for thousands and thousands of miles. <laughs> it was a well-used cinch. Um, so yeah, it was definitely helpful once I actually got to meet people who knew what they were doing rather than trying to hear from it and then apply it in front of me without getting kind of the visual aids. So there was definitely a lot of, of that aspect of it and not a whole lot of me knowing what I was doing in terms of camping. That was also the, the uh, upside of my mom coming with me for the first two weeks because I was having a really hard time understanding without ever having done anything like this, what I needed in a campsite or what to look for or what it was going to even look like out there because I'd never done it. Um, and so it was really helpful for the first two weeks. I was trying to meet my mom at nighttime at like a road crossing, because especially in SoCal, there's quite a lot of road crossings. It's not like you have these hundred miles of total wilderness of no road crossings. You usually only have, you know, 20 miles. Um, maybe a little more and maybe it'll just be like a dirt fire road you know it's not a very big road but it's something and so I'd meet my mom every night for the first I guess it was like 10 days that I was out there and during the day I would basically try to spot campsites and just you know as I'm riding down the trail trying to identify if I was out here and if it was getting dark what would I do and so I kind of had that mindset for those first 10 days when going down the trail without having to have the anxiety of, oh, I really do need a campsite. And so it kind of allowed me when my mom then, you know, had to go back to work and I was out there of knowing what I needed to look for and what kind of things were available and that kind of terrain. And, you know, you have to camp at a water source. Horses have to have water overnight or they get impaction. So that's like your main your main thing. A lot of hikers, um, you know, they can like fill up their water bottles at a water source and then still walk a couple miles and then dry camp where they, you know, can carry enough water for the night. The horses need, you know, they easily go through 10 to 20 gallons at, at overnight. And that's just like too much weight to carry. Um, so that's why you have to camp basically at a water source. And so that really restricts where you go. And so I did get pretty good at learning, you know, how far apart I needed my trees to be, you know, for the horses to comfortably fit on a high line and how to also spot a spot for my tent and where the water source was and where the grazing was and how that, you know, I would be out there too and kind of looking at my map and starting to realize when I was at a nice place in person, what did that look like on my map? What kind of elevation were we at? You know, what did the overall like taco map look like? And so kind of just while being out there and doing it, you know, I got better at being able to read the maps and predict campsites that I wanted to like shoot for the next day. And so that became helpful. You know, I'd get out on trail and I'd be like, all right, at this mile, I think there'll be a good campsite. And it was kind of like quizzing myself as I went of could I actually predict where maybe good campsites would be from the maps and so but I didn't get to really do that skill until I was out there but that was a big benefit of my mom helping me and you know she lived in LA and so again for basically the first 700 miles that first time every weekend she drove out to meet me and so I could plan the really tough sections that were in like the Mojave Desert and didn't have good water or good camping or good grazing or anything I could plan them out so that she would be out there to meet me at nighttime for those really tough sections. And so it was, you know, worked out really well and allowed me to, you know, get through some tough spots with her help and also learn, you know, and be like, kind of wean me off her help, you know, first 10 days, you get full help. And then for the next, you know, three weeks, you only get help on the weekends. And okay, now, now fly, you're on your own. And so it was a really good like weaning process in a sense that, you know, I'm very thankful for that, she, you know, we lived semi-close to the trail. Yeah, that's really helpful that she was so close. And it sounds like you probably ran into some issues. And I know um, I actually made a friend through this podcast who rode the Continental Divide Trail. And she told me of some stories of 
you know, some different encounters that she came across that she wasn't quite expecting along the trail and just some mishaps that happened. So did you have any mishaps or things that you just weren't quite expecting, you know, despite, I know you were doing a lot of this kind of, you know, on the fly learning it all, but is there anything that you were like, oh my gosh, I for sure was not expecting that. Definitely the first year, I felt like that was almost every day. Um, especially again, growing up in SoCal, you know, I, my, myself and my horses had never really dealt with like snowpack you know I'd gone to the, the ski lifts and seen that kind of snow but had never like seen snow in you know in July I'd never had anything like that before and I didn't understand like when the snow melts at what elevation versus what latitude you know I didn't really I didn't understand any of this stuff like how that all plays a role into it and how to you know predict and because I was trying to finish in time for grad school that was like in all honesty a terrible decision because grad school started in like late August and that's very early of a timeline to have and again totally lucked out it was a drought year that year and so if I had done this like on any other year it would have gone even worse than then you know it was um and so like, I was you know there's there was probably 1500 hikers that year or something like that and I think I was the third person to reach mile 700, like I was real early. I was hauling it through SoCal because I'm like, I got to finish by late August to get to grad school. And you really don't want to be at the front when you are the horseback rider because like, you know, the snow's not ready. You kind of have to have like one of the later timelines and you have to, you know, aim to finish more like late September. So I was basically like, you know, a month ish too early for everything. And again, thankfully it was a drought year. So things were melting sooner and things were becoming available sooner, but it was still pushing it too much. And I remember, you know, being, being worried about the Sierras and not understanding, like, how do I know if there's no snow? Because once you enter there, you know, there's not a lot of road access and you kind of are on your own for a couple hundred miles. And I remember it being very scary, you know, coming up towards the Sierra, you know, asking, locals and asking you know the handful of hikers that were kind of up there in that you know front of the pack with me like what is it going to be like like what does anyone actually know like what the snow is like and you hear about all these passes where you know you can't just get around an obstacle like you know there's it's just the trail and it's all this granite rock and like the pass has literally been carved into the side of a mountain so it's sheer on one side and it's sheer below you and you just have your little path and so there's not you know, if you have a five foot snowbank in front of you, like that's that, you know, you can't do anything else about it. And so, you know, I, I didn't even know that at the time, you know, I, I couldn't visualize it. I couldn't conceptualize that a trail could even look like that still or what the Sierras even looked like. I, I didn't know that they were that far above tree line. It was all so out of my ability to conceptualize. And so I'm trying as I'm riding to to understand and predict what I'm going to face without really having any, any perspective. So it was a lot of asking questions and, you know, no one actually knowing. And I've, and the hikers mottos are kind of just like, eh, you know, we'll get into the Sierra and we'll deal with it when we deal with it with the horses. They are just so much less equipped for snow that that's not really a good strategy to have for them. And so I remember, you know, getting into the Sierras and having to bail out after 50 miles and, you know, wasn't near my trailer because I kind of bailed out at a weird spot. And so I had to like, again, wait for my mom on a weekend to like make this very long drive to save my butt and, you know, pick me up and, you know, sitting there I remember for a couple of days and it was like below freezing temperatures and we weren't ready for those temperatures. And just, you know, very much being like, this is way not what I was expecting. Like I had never expected that I would deal with a snowstorm in May you know, and like not be warm enough, but then also the grass hasn't come in enough at that elevation. And that was also surprising. I thought I was going to enter the Sierra and it was going to be this land of green and it was not. And so it was, yeah, it was very, you know, like, oh, you know, trying to bring back into check what my expectations were versus what reality was, was a lot of the first ride and just really kind of understanding what is reality out there and what are my resources and the limitations and all that was every day was kind of like a reality check check they always have a saying you know that 
and for the hikers, like the trail provides. And like, you know, when you really need something, it will kind of happen. And I always was very bitter about that. I was like, I feel like mother nature just likes to slap me upside the head, you know, every day. She was like, nope, bad child. Like that is not how this works, you know, like humble yourself. And so that was like my experience out there, I felt like. <laughs> but um, but I learned a lot and you know, we did end up making it and you know, it was it was a very, very learning experience, which is why I was so happy to kind of do it again because I felt like that first time it was just, you know, like being taught as I went and you know, having to learn through trial and error. And I really wanted to see if it was possible to not do that because it's a very stressful way to go about a five month trip and <laughs> not having a plan and feeling like every day you know you're like i don't know i don't know what's gonna happen <laughs> it was a lot of anxiety so it was much much better once i you know from that first experience to then go back and start doing it again with an actual game plan kind of like with training the horses didn't really have a plan now i have more of a plan so i've definitely gotten a much better at preparing and understanding but uh, yeah, the first one, the first one was rough, especially just because I was so early that I had probably more obstacles than I could have if I just had a slightly different window. But because I was so early, it was just like one thing after another, especially with snow. <laughs> You're cracking me up with the whole snow thing. I can see how LA, somebody from LA is not used to the snow. Meanwhile, I'm looking out my window and it's dumping snow here in Colorado. So I'm just like, what is this life that you're talking about where you don't have to deal with snow with your horses? <laughs> and it's just like two like, it's different elevations, like understanding, you know, like I remember just like being my mind blown. I was, you know, dealing with snow and trying to, you know, I had tried to get into part of Oregon um, after my failed Sierra thing. And uh, that didn't, you know, that I got only so far before again, you know, Mother Nature slapped me down. She's like, nope, you will not pass thou shall not pass too much snow and so then I kind of like you know took my tail between my legs and went back to California finished up California went back to Oregon it's now July and thinking okay it's July it's gotta be clear you know it's July I'm fine I'll never have another snow problem you know I think I got out onto trail for like the first day in July after coming back after finishing up the rest of like the part of California and you know got like five miles and then just hit like five feet of snow and I kept thinking you know it was really hard packed and I was like maybe we can you know it's when I was pretty near the summit and I was like it'll just be a short distance you know maybe we can make it and you know we're going along and we make it over the summit and you know still still endless white ahead and I haven't seen a single person so I can't even ask anyone like hey you know how how much snow did you guys just stay on and we're getting along and now it's getting towards the mid-afternoon and like this you know like snow that was hard packed is getting softer and softer and now we're post holing and it just got to the point where we couldn't continue because it was so you know deep it was such deep snow in july it was like july 4th and you know we're not at a, some kind of i've been in california where the elevation's a lot higher like now we're only you know sitting at six thousand feet and i'm just like i don't understand i don't understand this didn't happen in california at six thousand feet like what is going on like why am I still dealing with snow in July at six thousand feet and so it was definitely just like that aspect like I didn't understand elevation or how that played a role at all into the equation that's so crazy but it sounds like it's been like a really fun journey so how many ri different rides have you been on and overall how many miles have you put on the trail uh, we've we we've done three um like border to border rides, two on the Pacific Crest Trail, one on the Continental Divide Trail. Um, we've done the Colorado Trail, which is five hundred miles, and the Arizona Trail, which is eight hundred miles. And we did our own little kind of route through um from the Grand Canyon to Wyoming. That was about seven hundred ish miles. And then um did the John Muir Trail, which is basically the PCT again. Um, just a little bit more in Yosemite, um, like not all the PCT, but just a small portion of it through the Sierras. Um, so yeah, we're about uh, ten thousand three hundred ish miles. I think we're in that we're in that ballpark. So done done quite a bit. I've been on a bit of a hiatus. You know, pandemic um, was obviously not the greatest year to be doing anything, and also I was acquiring a lot of horses and moving to a new property, which then allowed me to acquire even more horses. And so I've been very much in like an expansion mode over here 
and hoping to do a lot of training rides this summer. Because again, I train now and I don't just, you know, show up at the border like I did before. Um, so yes, training now and, you know, get, up, get the horses out on some training rides, make sure they're all ready, and then hopefully be back to doing, you know, some really big, you know, fun stuff um, by 2022 is kind of the goal. But we'll at least go to pretty places next summer. That's the plan. Just not necessarily in a continue. I won't have to ride to get there. I can drive. I'll take the shorter route. I'll drive to the pretty place and then ride rather than starting in, you know, the middle of the desert at a fence and be like, okay, now let's ride to the pretty stuff. But I'll, I'll save that for like 2022. You've proven yourself. I think you're allowed to drive to the pretty place and enjoy yourself a little bit. <laughs> Um, so you've dot, you've pretty much documented your journey on Instagram. You have a new short film coming out that we're going to talk about here in a minute, but like, was, was that always the plan to like kind of document it on Instagram or, or did it just kind of fall into your lap and, and people just really enjoyed you sharing your adventures? It definitely kind of fell into my lap. I was having like some saddle fit issues. And so, you know, I'd been buying and then reselling saddles on eBay, trying to find that magical fit and was feeling kind of like, this is very frustrating. And this was already after my first two Mexico to Canada rides. And I really wanted, you know, to have a uh, more, you know, quick slash, you know, less financially stressful way to figure this out. Cause I was poor. I was like, I didn't have a lot of money. And so I reached out to a saddle company to sponsor me and Tucker Saddles, and they were willing to sponsor me. But one of the requirements was I needed to have social media. And I had zero social media. I never had a Facebook. I never had a MySpace. I didn't even get a smartphone until I wanted to basically use the smartphone apps for the trails. I was incredibly, like, not in that realm. Um, and so I basically started an Instagram as part of like my contract and I had a friend that I'd made and she was, you know, pretty social media savvy. She was an artist and, you know, she kind of like, you know, coached me through it and like, hey, here's how you use the app. And so kind of between her and um, me being required to have it, I don't know if I ever would have gotten one if I wasn't required to, but I was required to. And then I loved it. I had such a great time and it was very much an organic thing. I didn't have any kind of goal for anything to happen and it just, happened, you know, the first, I don't know, probably took a year or so before I got really any traction. And then once you kind of get traction and you start having videos go viral, then it just kind of is like its own, its own machine that continues to run and generate. And um, yeah, it was definitely never a goal. It was kind of a happy accident for sure. I have another friend who is that the same thing happened to her where it was just kind of a happy accident. She she like does the mounted archery and just fun stuff on her horse and just kind of gained a social media following because she is, oh, um, Chloe? no, her name is person. Alex Bowen. Okay. Yeah. So, um, oh, is she in Arizona? She is. Yeah. Okay. I think I know which account you're talking about. I, yeah. I only really know of two of them. So I'm glad it was one of them. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've been friends, Alex and I grew up training. Um, we showed horses together and so we've been friends a long time. In fact, I just saw her last week, but, um, no, she, you know, it was that same kind of thing where she was just posting stuff that she was really enjoying doing and things just kind of started to go viral. And I think it's because you're, you're authentic, you know, it's not forced. It's not fake. It's not perfect. Like you're showing every aspect of your life, the good, the bad, the, the hard, you know, the troubles and, and, you know, the, the celebration of doing something. Yeah, I always struggle in the off season when I feel like I have to keep doing content, but, you know, I'm not doing anything all that exciting. You know, we're just riding around at home and, you know, I'm trying to like, you know, <laughs> work my butt off to make enough money to do it again in the summer. And so sometimes if there's like a, you know, like a lapse in exciting, fun stuff. And I always like worry, you know, because they always make it sound like, oh, the algorithm, you know, you must post every day at a certain time and, you know, do all these things to make sure that you have engagement. And yeah, I've never, you know, that was definitely not me. You know, I was terrible at, you know, I get anxiety, you know, if I have too many things on my plate. And so social media is one of those things that unfortunately sometimes gets the back burner. But amazingly, it's kind of worked out. And I think too, you know, not having it just be oversaturated or even just get diluted because you're being, you're forcing it and just, you know, waiting until you have something to say or you have something to share or something, you know, that actually 
you know, you, you want to do. I think that that's been, you know, my way of de- of uh, growing social media and kind of like beating this algorithm idea. I think maybe the algorithm thing works for lifestyle bloggers because it's their daily life that they're selling to people. I think when you are more of like an adventure account or you have some other kind of account, then, you know, do what's truly authentic because that's what will generate the more followers, you know, even if it's like not supposedly the algorithm. I think that that's much more effective for growing a social media following. Well, and just having those adventures are just, I know I like watching them and people I see in comment sections all the time, people are like, oh my gosh, that's so scary and those sorts of things. So they're able to kind of live through you without having to actually go do it. And they just think that that's so cool because it's authentic, it's real, and they're feeling like they're there alongside with you. And Nicole had mentioned a little bit earlier about your short film. So is that kind of what this is? Can you talk a little bit more about that and what that's going to be? Yeah, um, it's out on, on YouTube now, which is exciting. And it was basically just kind of like a short doc that Firestone sponsored. They were, you know, like my second sponsor, which is very exciting. I don't, I don't go after a lot of them. And so it always means a lot, you know, when, you know, it could be like a meaningful partnership. And so Firestone's been really nice about basically kind of like helping me continue to go and do these kinds of rides um, in exchange for helping, you know, provide some content for them. And, you know, they are kind of, you know, have like a people of the earth essence to them and they want to tell like true authentic stories and not do like necessarily the you know marketing thing in terms of it being you know pretty girls in bikinis or whatever and you know like oh now buy our beer they're going for like the more people of the earth aspect of it or meaningful and like having yeah more meaning to your life rather than necessary things in your life so that worked well in terms of us having those shared values um, and being able to bring that to their brand. And so they, you know, wanted to do like short films on kind of their, their uh, outdoor individuals that they were sponsoring. And so I got to be part of that. And my friend Dylan was, you know, their director for it. And so he, he was the one who kind of, you know, got me in there and made the introductions. Um, and then he got to film it, which so it always sounds nice, the idea of like film, it. oh, you know, cause I get asked all the time, do a documentary, do a documentary. And the logistics of pulling off said documentary are very difficult because, you know, none of these trails I go on are motorized or allow bikes even typically. And so the, the poor film persons have to hike, like they have to hike, they have to get in there because you can't even just bring along necessarily another horse because that does affect the dynamic, you know, with horses, they don't understand why their friend you know, is walking off without them while they're sitting there waiting with the photographer or, you know, and especially because I always travel alone, you know, adding in these extra elements definitely does change the dynamic a lot more than if it was already a group of people out traveling, you know, throwing in one extra horse or or a person doesn't necessarily alter the dynamic so much. So it was always, you know, kind of this thing of I didn't pursue it because I was not wanting to like, have to deal with another person that was you know not really understanding what I was about or what was involved and so that was the beautiful part of it being my friend who was the director because he already got all that and he could you know find the right you know cinematographers and he had all those connections and he could you know really make it a fun project and capture you know the way it kind of needed to be and so that was just great meeting of the minds in terms of Firestone being able to provide the opportunity and getting to work with my friend Dylan, who, you know, could kind of alleviate my usual like suspicion about embarking on something like that. And it was, it was fun. And it was really nice to, you know, not have to just try to tell it through a cell phone because there's only so much that I can ever capture or kind of show on a cell phone. And I remember someone saying in the comments too, for the video, they're like, wow, I've never heard you say more than a couple sentences, which also means they haven't been following my podcasts that I do these interviews. I obviously talk a lot now, but um, but yeah, I don't talk in my videos, you know, on social media, I never talk. And so I'm sure that, you know, they're like, oh, wow, here you are. And it's hard to share a podcast on something like social media because it's not visual. But again, the film was a great, you know, little snippet to be able to put onto social media and kind of just share in a different medium and in a different perspective and just, you know, really capture kind of more of the, a bigger 
arc of the story, not just the drop off views, you know, trying to get more of that aspect into it. And yeah, like I said, I loved it because it was such a good time. Um, yeah, I actually had a chance to watch it and I so enjoyed it and I loved learning more about you and uh, it was very, you know, it just felt very real and authentic. And like you said, you know, you could tell that you were very comfortable doing the things that you were doing and working with the people that you were working with. And um, so I loved it. And we'll be sure to share a link to it um, on our, our our website. And I know Michaela will probably throw it into the show notes, too, like we always do. So um, for people listening, be sure to check it out. It was really good. And the I mean, it's just beautiful. Like what you where you're going is just beautiful. So it's hard not to love it. But uh, I think you would actually really enjoy our, we do a lot of film too uh, for our company. And I think you would enjoy our videographers because we make them do that kind of stuff all the time. We, uh, we were originally <laughs> part of the company that owned Warren Miller Entertainment, Backpacker Magazine, all these skiing outdoors. And, and so all my videographers are always very excited when I'm like, yeah, we're shooting in an arena. And they're like, you mean we don't have to like pack out into Alaska when it's negative 10 out? Like, this is great. <laughs> Right? Yeah, exactly. And it's all about kind of perspective, but especially, you know, to hiking out, you know, for long distances while carrying stuff is never a fun time for any cinematographer. <laughs> we touched on your social media. So for anybody who is interested in learning more and watching these videos, if they maybe haven't seen your social media, how can they find you? Um, definitely through Rider is the best way to find me at the, at the moment. Um, so my Instagram is, you know, at T-H-R-U underscore rider. So that's pretty much how you can find me. Um, and, you know, Google is not a bad way to find, you know, I have a website. <clears throat> I'm currently in that awkward transitioning period where, you know, I made a website way back when just to kind of like have a little like blog to document it. And I've done a few too many rides. And I didn't, then I did that awkward transition from doing my rides on my blog to doing them on Instagram but I like to try to keep it as a way for people to find me that aren't on social media if they like get on to the Google. Um, and so there's also will eventually be a website but that can be accessed through my Instagram. But yes, Instagram and Google are definitely the ways to find me and eventually, you know, pull up, you know, either my social media or my websites that, you know, I could be reached at through email and all that jazz. And like we said earlier, your short film is going to be is, is actually on YouTube. So be sure to check it out there. Thank you so much for joining us. We, we've we loved following your content for a couple of years now. And so we were so glad when we were able to connect with you to do this. Yeah, it was a great time. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Well, thanks again. Uh, be safe on your next journey whenever that is. And we'll be sure to follow it along because it, it sounds like you have a lot of exciting stuff coming up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Definitely excited to see what happens down the road. Thank you again to Soft Ride for bringing you this episode of The Ride. For more information on Soft Ride Boots, go to www.softrideboots.com. Thank you guys for tuning into The Ride Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and please be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Follow Horse and Rider Magazine on social media and find us at horseandrider.com. If you guys have any questions or comments, please be sure to hit us up at horseandrider at aimmedia.com. We want to hear from you guys. And if you like what you're listening to, be sure to leave us a review on iTunes. How many stars, Michaela? Five stars, please.